thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here. Father, this morning just uh, fill the service with us. Father, inhabit it as we uh, try our best to love, honor, and adore you this morning. Father, we pray that everything we do and say are those things that please you. We pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Joan Church.
come to you with thankful hearts today. We thank you, Lord, that we are free to come to your house to worship you. We thank you for all that we have, Lord. We know that all that we have is given to us by you. We'd like to give back a portion of what you have allowed us to have for you to build your kingdom, not only here in the world, but around the world. We ask these things in your living son's name.
74? Okay, 74. 74 of us, individuals that together we make the picture of new hope. We are new hope. And we do reach out to somebody. Else. And next week is Easter. And in order to understand Easter, you have to have all the pieces. You have to see the entire picture. We have to start this week, and I hope you brought lunches, <laughs> at Genesis. And we have to go through the entire Bible this week to get us to the cross so that next week we can understand the tomb and the resurrection. And so we'll start off at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we have to understand that. God created. There was nothing. And if we understand that God created and God was there doing this, if we skip forward into the book of First John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, we understand that in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, Jesus was there. So you with me so far? Two puzzle pieces put together to start building the picture. And then we, we add to that, uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, that man sinned. Man sinned. We, we had the entire world, the garden, at our, at our grasp, and we wanted something we shouldn't have. None of you are ever like that, are you? None of you ever want what you shouldn't have? I can tell by your smirks. <laughs> you would have bit me out. <laughs> and so, put that piece in the picture. Sin enters the world. In Genesis 3, we read about the one who is going to come and crush the head of the serpent. It will strike at him, but he will crush the head. He is going to defeat death. All the rest of the Old Testament is about that. It's building who is God, what is God to us, what He wants from us, what, what life is all about, what He wants from you, and He builds it all through stair step after stair step. We can go through there and we can see Moses and Abraham and, and David and on and on and on the characters and we can see what they did in their lives for God. We can understand the stories. We, we get to see neat little stories like David and Goliath. We get to see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I can go on and on with stories, but every one of those is a piece of the puzzle. And you will never see the entire picture if you don't get it all. And so it's important in your lives that you read the Bible. That you see every story. That you understand every ounce of it. I mean... Yes, it's tedious and it's boring when you get to the part of, and they took 40 rods and 40 hoops to put on those rods to hang the curtains that went around the temple, and on those rods that were made of gold were the gold rings, and, and you can go on and on and on and build the temple. Why? Why is it important that you understand that? Attention to detail. Detail. <coughs> God is a God of detail. He wants us to understand Him and what it's all about. And in order to do that, we have to understand where He lived. Old Testament, He lived in that temple. When they built it and they made the Holy of Holies, He dwelled there, Scripture says. We have to understand that. And we come on through the Old Testament and we finally get to the New Testament where John the Baptist starts talking about the one. Now, if you lived back then in those times, you may not have understood the one. Today, you understand it because you have the whole Bible and you, you know who the one is. And, and that picture she showed you, that's the one. And what does he do today? <laughs> that picture. He holds the whole world in his hand. He has all power and authority given to him by God the Father to do whatever on that earth. 
And we get to choose whether or not we become part of the puzzle. <laughs> it's Sunday. Jesus is going from Bethany into Jerusalem. He's coming on a donkey. Scripture says a, a donkey's foal. He's entering the city to loud shouts. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched a, a movie on TV about Jesus and the triumphal entry when he comes to the city. They show a few people around putting palms down, stuff like this. But understand the picture. It is the week of Passover. It is a time when they all come in from everywhere to that town to celebrate. Scholars say that the attendance in town goes up almost a hundred times its regular population. <coughs> now imagine Fort Myers, and for every person, there's a hundred extra coming. <laughs> We have 74 here. That would mean we would have 7,400 jammed in this room. <laughs> Imagine it. That's what you have to picture. That's what's going on in this town. It wasn't just a few people. And the scholars believe it was both cheering and jeering. There were those who were cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Hosanna. Hosanna laying palm branches and their coats down in front of him on this donkey to come into the town, and yet there were others jeering him. Because they didn't like what he was doing to their religious system. You get the picture? Do you see him on the donkey? Do you see him coming in? I mean, that's the day of his entry and everything about it. Uh, everything I'm talking about, I would read to you. But one-third of the Gospels is about this final week. If we had time, I would read one-third of the Gospels, one-third of all four books to you, so you can get the full picture of what's going to go on. But you can pick it up in, in Luke chapter 20 and, and go from there, and, and they explain things. So Sunday is that day of triumph and of entry, when Jesus and his disciples come into town. They spend each evening back outside of town, about two miles away in a little town called Bethany. They retreat there to get away and get the things. Uh, the city is bustling. Everything is packed and overflowing. And so Jesus needs to get away each evening. So they get away Sunday night and they go back. Monday. What happened on Monday? Anyone know the story of Monday? If you were to look it up in, in Blackaby's book, he calls it the day of purpose. It's the day that, that Jesus is going to set forth the tone for the rest of the week. I don't know about you, I don't know if you ever looked at it this way, but his tone on that day wasn't cheerful and bright and shiny. You see, they left Bethany early in the morning, uh, got together with the disciples, and they're taking the two-mile walk down through the Kidron Valley and up to, up to Jerusalem. And, and as they're going through the valley from Mount Olive area, why is it called Mount Olive? Because of all the olive and, and trees and everything around. And Jesus, as he's walking there, the church says it was a bit hungry, and so he looks... And there's a fig tree. Scripture says the fig tree was full of leaves, a full, looking full of vibrant of life, and he thought, I'll go get a bite there. And he goes to the fig tree, and what does he find? <coughs> Nothing. 
Do you see his demeanor? If you read the story and you see it there, do you see his demeanor? What does Jesus do to the fig tree? Curses it. It says, you are barren now and you will be barren for the rest of your life. You will never again bear a fig. She's busy. Can you imagine that? Can, can you imagine this tree? Can you imagine if it's you? They go on into town. They're in town and it's swollen with people. And they make it to the temple. What's happening in the temple? What's happening in the place of worship? Now, understand, back in the Old Testament, we talked about, I told you that God went into great detail about the temple and how it was built and what it was for and all this stuff. I mean, it's there, it's part of the puzzle, so that you understand this part of the puzzle. Jesus goes to the temple. And in the temple there are money changers and merchants and all kinds of things. The town is so full of people are coming in, and what do the people have to do at Passover? Sacrifice. And so some engineering people like John Eric would uh, come to town with all his doves and goats and sheep and all the things. And based on what you could afford, he'd sell them to you at an inflated price because you need it. Because you didn't bring it with you to the town. And so, there you are. And they're in there changing money and doing all that kind of stuff. Jesus' demeanor. He just got done cursing a tree. He comes into town, into the temple, into the house, his words, of my father. And they've made it a what? A den of thieves. And he starts chasing them out and flipping tables and getting them out and saying, get, 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 get. Chapter 20, they start talking about things like that. And they ask, the, the, the Pharisees, Sanhedrin of the time ask, of what authority do you do this? And who are you to call this your house and your father's house? What was Jesus' reply? Huh? Well, answer this question. He's going to answer their question with a question. And he says... I will also, in verse 3, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Trap. It was a trap. Because if they say from heaven, then they're saying his authority is there. But if they say from man, then there's no authority and no, then there's they're going to talk bad about John the Baptist, who all these people revere. And so there they stand. And what is their answer? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> Liars. They knew. What were they doing? Another part of the picture. What were they doing? Protecting their own selves. You see, they lost the love of the Father. They allowed power and money to become their God. They didn't want anything to disrupt the system that was in place because they benefited from it. Are we supposed to benefit? From this? Yes, but not monetarily, not with power. We benefit with the love of God. We benefit with the knowledge and growing of, of our faith in Him, our obedience in Him. I mean, we get something from church worship, but it's, it's not power and money, is it? But that's what it became to the high priest Sanhedrin in charge. It became a job. But 
the picture in place. So Jesus clears the temple and claims it back for his father. It's a day that he sets things up. I found this little author who talked about it. And he says this, From the perspective of the chief priests, scribes, and Jewish leaders, it was one thing for this teacher from the backwaters of Nazareth to share his stories and make his claims and do miracles with his followers. But now he was in our territory. He was inside the holy city. He had entered the gates like he was some new David or a new Solomon. And now he has the audacity to declare that the temple is in essence belongs to him and his father. Who is he to suggest that the Jewish system was unable, un, was enabling sin rather than worship? How dare he argue that the Jewish authorities were ignorant and true godliness of true godliness and piety? From this point forward, there would be no turning back. Jesus did not come to shrink back, but in fact, he himself is accelerating the sentence of death. So Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. That's what they're telling you here. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He was putting the pieces in place so that he could get the fright. Now think about it. On Sunday, he rode into town on a donkey with people cheering him and laying the cloaks down. And while he rode that donkey, he knew this. In five days, I die. How many of you ride into that town? If you knew in five days they would kill you. How many of you come back to that town on Monday and start showing your power and authority? And start start just doing things. I mean, he is riling up the crowd. I mean, you see right here the Sadducees and priests that they're already of what authority? Who are you? To be doing these things. And because they couldn't answer him, verse, chapter 20, verse 8, he says, Then neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And he went on to tell the people a story. He tells a story about a vineyard owner who set up this great vineyard and got it all set up and very profitable, and then he leased it out to some people. And when it came time for them to pay the rent for that vineyard, he sent a servant down and they beat him up. He sent another servant and they beat him up. He sent a third servant and they beat him up and he thought this. Well, surely, if I send my son, they'll respect him and treat him with authority. So he sent his son and they beat him up Killed. <clears throat> Strange story to tell in the midst of all this, isn't it? What's the story about? The story is about <coughs> Genesis to now. It's about a God who sent Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and we can go on and on and on and on through the names to tell the people who he was and what he was, and they wouldn't listen. We, we can look at the Israelites all throughout history, in trouble, out of trouble, banished, sold to slavery, brought back. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. We can see it because they didn't listen. And the story is about all of that, but he says then the master sends the son thinking, well, by this authority they'll take it. What he's telling his disciples, teaching them, or telling the people is, I'm he. 
I am the master's son. You should, you should see my authority and hear my power, and yet they're going to what? They're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. We know that, don't we? They go back to Bethany. On Tuesday, they come rock, walking back to the town, and they come by the fig tree, and what happened to the fig tree? Withered, shriveled from the roots up. Everything is absolutely dead. Why is that story in here? What makes the fig tree a piece of the puzzle? It was Jesus proving his authority, even over nature itself, by just speaking the word. Oh, wait. We heard that in Genesis, didn't we? God spoke and it was created. <coughs> that power that God had to create the world, Jesus now demonstrates to kill the tree. Just simply by speaking it, showing I am He that was in the beginning, it was the Word, it is the Word that is God. <coughs> and so you put it all together and the picture starts growing and you're starting to see it. <coughs> Tuesday. The glimpse of his authority. The rest of the day is pretty quiet. Wednesday, it's called the day of silence. Nothing. We don't read about them coming into town again. We don't read about them leaving town. We don't read about what's going on in town. It's the day of silence. Thursday. Thursday, they call it the day of preparedness. What takes place on Thursday? <coughs> well, they come back to town, and while they're on their way to town, Jesus tells a couple of his disciples, Hey, go on ahead, find the man with the donkey in the city center. He'll take you to an upper room. Prepare that upper room so that we might have the feast, the feast together. They're coming together for a feast. They're in town for the feast of the Passover. They're getting ready to prepare for that. And so they go ahead and do that. They're preparing the feast. Jesus starts telling stories this day. And the stories are all there to prepare the disciples for what's to come. Skip to later that evening. That's all you hear about them during the day. Skip that evening and you find them reclined at the table. Now, reclined is right. A low table, they're probably laying with their arms on a pillow, leaning sideways, eating. I mean, lazy people, right? How many of you would like to just lay around and eat? <laughs> but there they are, reclined. Ooh, we do Thanksgiving, don't we? I think this year I'm going to put my table on the floor so I don't have so far to go. Uh, but, but, when you look at the whole thing, I mean, they're there, they're eating this, this meal, this feast, and how did they start it off? They walk into the room, and Jesus has taken off his cloak and put on a servant's apron. And as they walk in, Jesus, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, is on his knees washing their feet. Do you remember the discourse? I know Gary does because he portrayed it one year. You know the discourse, don't you? What did Peter? Peter gave him grief, didn't he? What? Oh, Peter. <laughs> Peter. Going to give him grief and say, oh, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And Peter's reply is what? Well, here, wash all of me. My head, my hands, my... Here. You know... Wash me then, so I am totally a part of you. That's what Peter was saying. When he was saying, wash all me, totally a part of you. Put the puzzle piece in. Peter. Key character. They're reclining around the table and they're talking. And Jesus starts another discourse. One of you at this table will betray me. What? What? 
Yeah, I hear you murmuring. I think it's probably like that that day. Not me, not me. And the Lord, surely not me. They're excellent. Is it me? The one that the one that it is that knows who he is. And Judas jumps up. Can you imagine? I mean, here we are, a church, New Hope. We're the picture here for, for salvation for people. We're all here to set up and your minister does something about it. I don't know what it is. But I'm a sinner, so I might I might do it. And I say, well, one of you caused it. And you'd all be like, me? Me? What did I do? What did I do? What did I do? What did I say? What? You know. And he says, ah, oh, the one of you that did it, you know. So Gary jumps up and runs out. And uh, goes and does what he has to do, Scripture says, right? I mean, can you imagine? This, this is not your normal Passover feast. This is some intense stuff that they're wondering, is it me, is it me, is it me? Enter, enter Peter again. Oh, you got to love the man. Lord, not me. I'd never do it. What? Before the cock crows three times? You would deny me three times? Surely not me, Lord. Now, when you look at that picture, reclining at the table, how many of you are Jews? <coughs> how many of you have betrayed Jesus in your life? How many of you would be the one to hang him on the cross? Or maybe you're Peter. How many of you denied him? And I'm ashamed to say it, it's more than thrice, isn't it? And yet there we are. Judas is gone. Peace is done. Jesus institutes what we call today the Lord's Supper. We have shared it today. He takes his, the bread and says, Take, eat, for this is my body. Present it to you. I mean, this is my sacrifice for you. I'm going to tell you something right here, straight up. Duh. That's what was in the head of each one of the disciples. What is he talking about? We get it because we get to read about it and get to study it and we know what it all is about. But he's sitting at that table in the midst of the Passover feast and he's saying that this is his body. What is he talking about? Then he picks up that cup and he drinks a little and he passes here, drink. This is my blood. What? Are you a vampire? I mean, you're thinking things and it's like, he's lost it. This week has been too much strain and stress on him. He's lost it. But he draws it on in and says, eat and drink to remember me. For I will not eat and drink him again until my father's house. He is trying to teach them and us that these things are going to happen. It's coming. We are knocking at the door of death. Everything I've taught you for the last three, three and a half years or so is coming to a culmination. Everything we've read about from Genesis on, the picture is almost complete. We're going to be able to see the whole thing any, any time now. And when they get done with the meal, he says, hey, come and pray with me. It's been a long day. They left Bethany early in the morning. They trekked the two miles to Jerusalem. They're in the middle of the town. They've done stuff all day. They're in the upper room. They're having this feast. It's at night. He says, come to the garden and pray with me. They walk wherever, from wherever they were to the garden. They get there. The disciples sit down. He takes his three closest his three amigos that aren't going to leave him, the three that he can trust to go a little bit farther and pray with him. <coughs> Put yourself in the garden. Jesus is praying. He stops and turns and looks. 
And not just the disciples they left behind, but the three closest are doing what? Sleeping. I told you it was late. For most of you, it was after 9 o'clock. <laughs> you know where you are at 9 o'clock. And he said to them, pray, and they just, they couldn't. Exhaustion. And he hollers at him and says stuff, and he says, you know, can't you even stay with me just a little while? Jesus knows what's coming. They're clueless. They're like us. Sometimes we're clueless when it comes to what God's doing and what's up. It's not until we see the full picture that we get it, and they're not getting it yet. And he goes back to the garden, he starts to pray, and pray so fervently that what? Drops of blood like, or sweat like drops of blood coming from his temple. I mean, gang, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road with him. Listen to his statement. Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. What he's saying is, man, I'll die for them, but man, is there some other way? Is there some other way that salvation can come to these people without me dying? But he didn't hesitate in that prayer. They don't, they don't show that there was a time lapse. They say, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me, but back to the Father. Not my will, yours be done. And that, that teaches us a whole big thing right there. Whose will do you live by? Who's directing your life? You or Him? You see, because if it was human Jesus, if it was His choice, His decision, He walks away. But he wasn't just human, he was also God. And he took his human side and turned it back to the Father. <laughs> Jesus knows this. I was born with a mission. And that mission happens tomorrow. While he's in the garden praying, soldiers show up with Judas. And in the most horrific way you could think of, Judas is going to betray him. You see, because they greeted their friends and their loved ones with a kiss. I mean, when you walked in the doors of the church, how many people kissed you this morning? Joyce, how many kissed you? None. They don't like you or love you. Okay? Joyce is not love. No. Okay. Liz kissed her. <laughs> That's a picture we could erase from the puzzle. Okay. But but they would walk in the door of the synagogue and they would get hugged and kissed by their friends and their and their loved ones. That was their greeting. Today we might bump a fist or shake a hand or pat someone on the shoulder. Or don't pat Pessy on the shoulder. I say that sequentially. But that's their greeting. And so Judas comes into the garden and does what? Kisses him. He takes, he takes the act of a friend or a loved one to betray him. Man. Getting tense in the garden. Peter, enter him again. Jumps up, grabs a sword, knocks the ear off one of the soldiers. And we gloss over this. We, we don't go into depth with this. Right then and there, <coughs> Jesus proves his power and authority. He picks the ear up, touches it to the head of the soldier, and it's as if it was never cut off. Now, I want to. I want to try that. Come here. 
<laughs> no, I want to be the cutter. I will be here. Who wants to be the soldier? <laughs> that, that boggles my mind when I read that. Sometimes we just gloss over it. Right there and there, those soldiers saw who he was. Those disciples were reminded who he was. I can't understand why after this, it's not talked about again. He's arrested in that garden. He's taken before Pilate. And why didn't someone say, Pilate, you should have seen what happened in the garden? They cut his ear off, and he took it and put it back on. Case closed. The power and authority over life and death itself was demonstrated. Not talked about. Instead, they're talking about, should we scourge them? Should we beat them? Should we hang them? I don't know. What do we do? Well, he's Galilean. Oh, a Galilean. <laughs> Send him to Herod. He's his problem. Pilate didn't want anything to do with him. <clears throat> Pilate knew of this thing. You go through the whole thing, and he's back and forth between Pilate and Herod, and finally he gets to Pilate, and Pilate says, well, I don't know what to do. It's this day that we allow one of our thieves to go free. So Pilate, clever man, thinking about it, I'm going to get the vilest and worst of all offenders. I'm going to get a guy who's a murderer, a rapist, a slanderer, a, you name it, this guy probably was in on it. I'm going to get that guy against this Jesus. Pilate thought he had an out. Okay, who do you want set free? Barabbas. Who? Barabbas. Who? And the crowd gets louder and louder and starts chanting. And, and people, if you're a leader, you would lead in your chant. If you're a follower, you would just follow along. So if it was the crowd here today, what are you cheering? You see, because that crowd consisted of some of the same people who were laying cloaks down in front of this man days earlier. What? We were calling him Lord of Lord, King of Kings, Hosanna, Hosanna, and, and putting our clothes down. And today we're going to say Barabbas. Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And so Pilate has Jesus scourged. <coughs> it's not enough for the crowd. Well, what will you have me do with this man then? Crucify. Now, we like to sit here and think, I would not be that person. I would not be part of the crowd crying for Barabbas or saying crucify him. No, really. We cry for Barabbas or we cry crucify him every time we sin. Jesus died on the cross for our <coughs> sins. Now we see that Jesus ripped up, beat to a pulp, carrying a cross, being walked through the city as he heads towards the hill of Golgotha. And those people who cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, are part of that crowd standing on the streets, spitting on him, <coughs> calling him names. Where's the disciples? Where's his <clears throat> trusted men? Man, where are the close three? Well, we know where Peter was, warming himself. Hey, you're one of them, aren't you? It's okay. You tell us, are you one of them? No. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I saw you. You were with him. He was walking. Yeah, you were walking in the town. You're one of his. 
That's, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. And on the third time, he didn't just say it. He screamed it. You can just see it. It is building. And he's left this point there. Why? What's wrong with Peter? Fear. Fear makes us do things we don't want to do. His fear was, if I say I'm one of his, they might beat me and put a cross on my back and make me walk through town too. I'm not ready to do that yet. How many of you are ready for that? How many are you willing to take the same punishment Jesus got for being his? I'll bet none of us. And we see him there on the ground, his arms stretched out, and you hear the hammer hit the nail. Imagine there at the foot, kneeling on the ground, mom. Imagine her pain and sorrow at watching what's happening to her son. Imagine sitting there hearing a hammer hit again again and again. And then sit there as you watch them raise your son up on that cross and drop him into that hole. His body comes down with a thud on those nails. And yet he has the ability and power to pee on there and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I wonder if it, the soldier driving the nails was one of the ones in the garden that saw him put the ear back on. I wonder if he's walked through town with him and saw the people. I wonder if he's heard other people talk about him. I wonder what was in the soldier's mind that was there doing all this. Did we hear the word, surely this was the son of man? Did he change lives with his death? And he changed my life with his death. I have the ability today to be forgiven because of him and his willingness to die for me. He finally utters those final words, it is finished. It's done. What he meant was, the picture is almost complete. And each puzzle piece is a story in itself. Each puzzle piece gets put together into this into this thing that we look at and it's like, oh my God. And we have to understand that he did that for us. He did that for me, for my sin. He did it for you, that you could be forgiven. He did it so that you might have life and have life more abundant than ever before. He did it so that you might one day live with Him in heaven. But He Himself isn't there yet. He says it's finished and they allow people to take him down, his, his followers to take him down and to prepare his body and to put him in a tomb. And to make sure that nothing would happen, the tomb is sealed and guards are placed at it. Why? Because Pilate and Herod thought, well, maybe these radicals will come steal the body and try to make us think he's alive. We know what's going to take place. Today we leave them right there. This week we get to think about that Jesus. Who 
who prepared the way, who went through the week to get ready for the day that he would die. And it's always hard to go to a sermon like this and leaving him in the grave. Sunday's coming. We know that on that day, what's going to take place, and next Sunday we'll celebrate that together. And so think on those things. Think about his life. Think where he's at. Think next week we get with the final piece of the puzzle into the picture. Next week we get to see the entire picture. Beginning to end. Or is it the entire picture? We'll go over more next week. But if you're here this morning and, and you don't know that Jesus, that Jesus that did these things we'll talk about this week, if you don't know that person who he is God himself, I want to give you an opportunity to know him. We're seeing him of invitation, an opportunity for you to come forward and claim him as yours. And maybe today it was a reminder to you of that Savior that you claimed years ago. Give us a reminder of the life that you need to be living because of what He did for you. I mean, this morning we came around the table. We took His body and His blood. We internalized Him in us. <coughs> he now lives in us. We accept Him as our Lord and Savior and, and said so. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Him. It's no longer my will, but His. Today, if you're sitting here and it was a reminder of you, wake up. If you need to get back into Christ, into walking and living for Him, I'll tell you to do that too. Whether you need to do it there at your seat and just talk to Him and say, God, what a week I've had. You ever come home and say that? What a week i had. Wow, what a week he had for us. Now it's our turn to live this week for him. So if you have a choice to make, whether it's a first time choice or to renew yourself in him as we stand in the scene, make your choices. <laughs> to sing praises to you, to honor you, and, and to love you for who you are. And 
for what you've done for us. Father, we praise Jesus for his willingness to die for us and to give us salvation. <coughs> Father, we pray that uh, we don't just take that lightly, but that we will live that out, that we will share that with others, that we can share with them that we live and serve a risen Savior. Father, we love you and adore you. We pray that you'll be with us and guide us throughout this week as we uh, celebrate you and come to that great day of Easter with you. Father, we love you and we adore you. We thank you for today. Amen.